There you go. Okay, you should be able to see my screen right now. Let me double check on that. Uh, like this. Okay, so thank you so much. I hope everybody can hear me properly. Um, I'm going to talk to you to about this project that I've been trying to spread awareness the past five, 10 years now uh, throughout South Florida. I'm very active here in Broward County and uh, to some extent in West Palm, but I'd like to expand this to Miami-Dade because uh, you are as at risk as we are up north to this invasive serpent termite, which unfortunately is changing the dynamic on how we should actually be concerned about termites as a whole throughout South Florida. So hopefully today, this will uh, give you a primer on what's going on uh, because ultimately the major problem that we currently have is the simple lack of awareness that this is a problem. So I hope today you'll have a better understanding and appreciation of what's going on and hopefully uh, move forward uh, potential for solutions to basically protect structures for homeowners and also protect the urban tree canopy. And I'm gonna explain why this is such a big issue. So before we do this first, what are termites? This is kind of a thing that people tend to be confused because they look different and they, their biology is kind of very unique. So termites in the world, we have about 3000 termite species. Uh, less than 3% of them are considered as pests, which means most of the species are just doing their things in the environment and are not a problem. All termites feed on some kind of lignocellulose, so plant material, uh, and especially here, wood in some uh, extent. They all feed through symbionts, so they have microbes in their gut that allow them to digest through wood. And finally, they are eusocial, so just like ants and bees and some wasps, they form colonies where only a few individuals will do the reproduction and most individuals, the rest of the colony are sterile, but doing all of the work and a, and a care. So uh, these colonies have a high potential for consumption because it's a lot of mouth to feed when you think about it. The concept of termite as a pest is a very anthropomorphic concept. We decide that these are pests. Um, it's just that they happen to eat what we build or cultivate, depending on the species and the location around the world. And technically, termites have been doing this for about 100 million years, way before we were here. So for them, we're just part of their environment and not the other way around. Some species are technically at the wrong place because we brought them in specific places around the world and we've been moving their distribution around the world. I explained this in a bit. And of course, they tend to be creepy crawlies, which uh, tend to uh, not go very well with uh, Mrs. Jones when they show up in their house. And more important, contrary to most other uh, insect pests that can show up in a household, this one can really have an impact on the financial uh, outcome of a family because most of the investments of a, a single home family is in the mortgage itself, the, 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 the real estate. So having extensive damage can really hit the bottom line for families. So most termite species have a function in the ecosystem. The reality is, as I said earlier, most termites are doing their thing without us uh, out there. And they have an important role in the composition process within these ecosystems. They contribute to soil enrichment and also buffer some of the drought effects. Very importantly, they are part of the food chain in most of the tropical systems around the world. Remove a termite, the ecosystem partially collapses. Now, as social insects, they have been uh, they have been compared many times with ants because they have a lot in common in terms of society and uh, social behaviors. But technically, ants and termites are fundamentally different because ants are Holometabolous, which means just like butterflies, they have to go through metamorphosis. And they are deri derived wasps, which means that all of the ants you see crawling around in the environment are technically adult ants that went through metamorphosis. Termites, just like cockroaches, grasshoppers, and other insects, they have a, a partial molt. They don't have to go through metamorphosis. They just keep on molting until they reach the adult stage. 
except in termites, all of these workers are keep on molting for the rest of our life, which means they're kind of stuck in a juvenile state. So the societies of termites are mostly based out of a juvenile population, not adults like we would find in ants, bees, and wasps. And they're technically derived cockroaches. They're very different than cockroaches, but they are related to cockroaches. So what are common to ants and termites was obtained through evolutionary convergences. Um, so what we have to understand is termite colonies are fundamentally a family unit. You have a king and a queen on this picture, and around you're gonna have their young, the workers, but they're gonna take care of them and everybody and everything else within the colony. The problem is within termite, we have different castes, which look very different, despite the fact it's the same family, they all share the same genes, technically, but they have different function. We're gonna have a king and queen, their job is to mate and produce eggs. Eggs hatch into larvae, which molt in further into soldiers and uh, workers, and some individuals will turn into soldiers. And the soldiers are in charge of defense, while the workers are in charge of finding the food and taking care of everybody. Termite colony life cycle is often what is the most confusing because at any point in time, somebody is going to see either an infestation in a tree or in a house or the individual that are swarming, that are flying out there. The fact is, the ones that are flying are the same thing. It's the same species. It's just the part of their uh, biological cycle. So let's go over it quickly. What's gonna happen during swarming season, which is when the mature colony produce these winged individuals. They fly, their job is to disperse eh, a block or so away, find a potential mate, they drop their wings at this point. So they only need their wings just to fly away from their uh, parental nest. And once they isolate themselves somewhere, they can mate, produce the eggs, and the eggs are going to hatch, grow, molt into bigger and bigger individuals, which at this point become workers. Some of them will turn into the soldiers. And finally, when the colony is mature enough, after five to uh, maybe more years, they produce what we call the nymphs, and the nymphs develop finally into the elates, which is the winged individual. Sorry about that. So this winged individual are very important because they're the one that are going to uh, basically, let me close that for a second, uh, that are gonna spread the genes away from the colony and make new colonies. And this is the swarming season. This is when people notice they have termites. Give me a second here. My love is... Okay, so we're to teach these students <laughs> distracting. So the life cycle is very important because when people see them, they, usually when they're flying out there and enter their house because the door was open and there was lights and this is what termites do. And they think they have termites. That is not really true. Not always, at least. These swarmers, these uh, elates, these winged termites are just telling you you live in an area with termite activity. Most of the time, these termites fly in and dry out and die. But if you do have an infestation structure and they fly from the inside, then it's a whole different story. So knowing that subtility between having an infestation or living in an area with infestation makes a big difference uh, that can be dozens of thousands of dollars if you're infested or not. So this is a time of the year where you're gonna see termite flying. Uh, it starts in February, where we have the Asian separate termite swarms from mid-February to all the way to uh, mid-April. And around early April to now, we have Formosan separate termite. And uh, within, which we started in early May to end of June, is going to be the dry wood termites. So we have different species that are flying throughout spring and depending on who's showing up in somebody's house is going to be a very big difference in terms of is there a need for treatment and what type of treatment is going to be because each species needs to be addressed very differently. And 
because we're living in a changing environment, a changing landscape with invasive species showing up once in a while, we need to relearn our basics to adapt to this changing environment. So this is Coptotermes gastroi, the Asian subterranean termite. And it's gonna be the main focus because this is the one that I believe is in the process of becoming the major termite problem throughout South Florida. Uh, and it already is for some specific neighborhoods that have been infested for decades. And it's gonna be somewhat everybody's problem 10, 20 years down the road. So this is probably the one that needs to be, uh, uh, we need to raise awareness of. Fact is we live in South Florida. Uh, we have the highest termite diversity. We have about 15 species in between uh, West Palm and Monroe. Uh, and basically we're dealing with the highest termite diversity throughout the entire country. But truly three species are really the big uh, culprit in terms of doing damage to structures. And this is where I am, um, where <laughs> this is why I'm not in Gainesville, by the way, because that termite pressure is here down in Southeast Florida. So we have a lot of different genera. We have about 20, 21 species. Uh, six species are invasive. And of course, in this case, the invasive species tend to be the most problematic because uh, our current environment never really evolved with that kind of termite pressure. So the focus today is going to be primarily on coptotermies, which represent both the Formosan supreme termite and the Asian supreme termites. Now, when people say they have termites, this is the first thing you're going to think of. You're going to see the frass coming out, the baseboard, uh, the door, uh, window frames, uh, sometime within the attic or cabinets. And once in once a year, you're going to have these wings popping up here and there. Usually it's gonna be the time for you to tent your house through structural fumigation. This termite is called Cryptotermis brevis. This is West Indian drywood termite. It has been here for hmm, 300 years and everybody either has it or is about to have it. This is the most widespread termite throughout Southeast Florida and also along the coast on, on the West Coast. And this is the easy, low hanging fruit in terms of remedial, because we know what to do. This species only does small colonies, infest a single piece of wood at a time, and doesn't need to be connected to the ground, doesn't have access to water. The way to do it is to seal the house with tarpaulin, inject a gas, kill everything, remove a tent, wait for the gas to dissipate, and you can come back in your, ho your home that has been reset from any living things, including all the termites that were infesting there. So I wanna make sure that we cover this because this is the most common problem, but it's also the easy one to remediate. And I am not gonna talk about that species today because we know what to do. What I wanna talk about is Coptotermes, these invasive subterranean termites, not these drywood termites. Now, these species, most invasive termite species, actually are associated with human activity and they come through boats. 99.9% .9 of spread of termites around the world is done by boats. In few cases, it's going to be through commercial boats. In the very, very vast majority, it's going to be personal private boats, luxury yachts. These are the primary spreader of termites around the world. So when you see a boat somewhere on the dock in, in Miami, in Fortaudel, in West Palm, chances either they're bringing something or we're exporting something else somewhere else because boats are the perfect vessels for some of the species to spread around. So the, the divine joke is actually very accurate. Boats is the one helping species to survive and spread in various parts of the world. Now, we are in a very unique place geographically. We are in Southeast Florida, which means we have a tropical climate compared to the rest of the state. And therefore we are 
a good place for a lot of species that are very successful in tropical environments to actually uh, survive in our environment, which is a case for the Asian southern termites and to some extent the Formosan southern termites, which is a subtropical species. It doesn't really do well in truly tropical environments. But we are in an area between West Palm and Homestead that is a highly urbanized area where we have give or take 7 million people living there. And we have the two most invasive and damaging termites that have established and thriving in this environment. This is by definition, a recipe for disaster. And technically it is to some extent, and I'm gonna go through this. So here we are historically Formosans have been established for more than uh, 50 years at this point, uh, 50, uh, 40 years, technically, they showed up in 1980. But in 1996, uh, the first infestation of Asian Supreme termites was found is somewhere in Miami. And since I showed up in Fort Lauderdale, Riviera Beach, and Key West, and is in the process of basically spreading throughout the entire urban environment throughout Southeast Florida. And this gives you an idea of a timeline of the spread of the species. So we can see in the early 2000s, two species in yellow is Formosan, in red is Asian subs. Uh, only spotty in some areas where they first introduced, but over the years, they start building up populations, more colonies, and we are the one moving them around by moving infested materials from one place to another. You'll notice that most of the time, they show up in area that is close to boats, not a surprise. Uh, this means that fast forward uh, for 2040, 2050, about half of the people living in, in South Florida will be at risk of infestation of either species, uh, which means that the termite problem is not going anywhere. It's only going to get worse. And this is why it's important that we are aware that this is happening and we can prepare to protect structures and, as we will see, protect trees. So this is our beast. This is Coptotermis gestroi, the Asian southern termite. You can see that the soldiers here look very different than the wing termites, the elates, but this is technically the exact same species. One you only see during the swarming season, one you only gonna find uh, somewhere in your attic or your crawl space when you realize you have an infestation. Now the swarming season for the two species is a bit different, as I said earlier, uh, between February to May, we, uh, April, let's say we have the Asian sprint termites. And right now we are toward the end of the Formosan sprint termites, but have been swarming now for almost a month. Mm -hmm. And eventually, as I said, this is what uh, people will find in their house, a dead termite, because subterranean termites need water to be able to start a colony somewhere and inside a house is too dry for them to simply survive. So if somebody find a handful of elates of winged termites in their house, they probably flew from the outside and find their way inside. And that's pretty much it. It doesn't mean you have an infestation. If you have thousands of them, that means they flew from the building and therefore you have a, this is a smoke signal telling you there's a fire somewhere. So these termites, as they establish colonies in the environment where they have access to source of moisture, they can grow and within five years reach maybe a million individuals. And a million individuals is a million mouths to feed. Therefore, the potential for damage is relatively fast compared to dry wood termites that only do small colonies, maybe a thousand termites or so, where the damage uh, potential is actually relatively slow. So Cup termites with Formosan and Asian succulent termites uh, have this potential to do a lot of damage. And therefore, this is why they're so infamous in terms of if you have them, is when you realize you have them, it's unfortunately often too late. Which was the case here for a neighbor of mine in my street. Uh, they were renovating their kitchen. And in the process, they realized that most of the frame, wood frame of the entire area, was simply chewed up by uh, Asian superintermites. 
So the damage here was more than $50,000 worth of damage that they have to uh, add to the initial renovation process that they had in mind. Uh, for a small family home, it is a significant amount of money. Uh, we've seen far worse in some multimillionaire uh, villas in, in West Palm Beach, uh, where within six months, they did, they did a quarter million dollar worth of damage in some of these very expensive houses. So it's not something we can neglect. Large mature colony of Formosan or Asian cement termites, which is about 5 million at this point, can feed about 300, 300 pounds of wood per year and potentially, potentially more. So that is a significant amount of wood. Once you realize you have them, if you poke through the paint, because at this point the wall is partially gone, you're going to have these soldiers coming at you telling you that you have a problem and an infestation. The reality is the infestation almost never starts in the structure. It always starts somewhere in the environment. And as termites expand their foraging territory to find more food, in the ground, uh, completely uh, uh, in, uh, hidden, technically, they find root system, they found cables, they, they found pipes and electrical conduits that leads them to places which happen to be our houses. And you can see here the exhaust pipe for the, the, the bathtub. They found it, they followed it, they made all of these mud tubes. That pipe led them straight to the wood floor. And eventually this was a snowbird house in West Palm Beach. They were not here for six months. They came back, they moved into their house and they went through the subfloor because at this point it was gone. So this shows you the kind of damage he was able to do within simply six months. Problem with this subterranean termite is we simply don't know where the actual colony is. All you see is active infestation, but the rest of the colony is potentially up to uh, 300 feet away from what you actually see. You don't know where the king and queen are, for example. And this is why fumigation is not working on subterranean termites. You can kill just the few termites that were in a house at the moment you fumigate but 90% of the colony is not in the structure. So the moment you remove the tarp and the gas dissipates, the colony moves back in within days potentially. So this is why fumigation is only remedial for dry wood termites. So this is a soldier next to the nursery with all of the uh, eggs. Now, what we realized in the past 10 years is it's true for Formosan, but it's even more true for Asian subterranean termites. They start their colonies at the base of live, healthy, large trees. It could be oak trees, it could be fruit trees, it could be pine trees, it could be uh, palm trees, it could be anything. That species doesn't care what they feed on because they're fairly flexible in their source of food. So any type of trees is potentially up for grab at this point. This is a gumbalimbo, for example. And gumbalimbo are very soft, fast growing native trees that termites chew like uh, through it like it's candy, basically. And you can see the base of a tree is simply gone. At this point, the tree collapses on weight. Uh, this is a case of infestation on a palm. This is a Washingtonia. This is a sable palm. And you can see here which is often difficult when you're not to, used to. But when you start losing closer, you see these mud tubes going with the grain of a, of a plant. And when you knock it off, you see these termites coming at you. So when you have winged termites flying out there, they queue to the trees and find a mate, potential mate at the tree and start a colony at the tree. Another case here, it's a bald cypress. They get into it and they pipe it from the inside. When you cut the tree, this is what you're going to see. This is an oak tree. And on the surface, it's going to be so obvious when you start looking for it. You're going to see this mud or mud tubes that accumulate. And it's going to be a very different color and texture than the actual bark grain. And when you see that difference, you can detect infestation really fast. This is an extreme case where you have a mud basically covering the bark, which is a telltale sign. 
my favorite place to look for infestation in trees, it's going to be at pruning wood because the prune is not going to look right. You're going to have mud instead of actual uh, uh, healing process of a tree. So yeah, they fly, they go to trees, they start colonies there. Another oak tree, pruning wood, classic. Two different parts of the same tree, two different pruning woods. But you also see, so see at the bottom of the left picture, uh, massive mud that was scrapped off by the homeowner wondering what was going on. If you do that uh, scraping, again, you have all of these soldiers coming at you, telling you they're very unhappy you disturbed their house, which is what it looks like. The soldier have his opening at the front of the head where they secrete glue, which uh, is kind of irritating and is a defensive component uh, against predators and competitors. So it's a defensive secretion. Unfortunately, these oak trees and any other type of tree, most of them are piped from the inside to the point where it cannot sustain its structural integrity. Therefore, the tree is in the process at this point of collapsing on its own weight. And I've seen this situation too many times now. Uh, this is a case of a, I don't know, 85 year old oak tree uh, that survived Andrew, Katrina, Wilma. It did not survive Irma. This was the case uh, where basically most of the biomass of a tree was turned into termite poop at this point, which does not hold the tree under strong winds. So we're dealing in a situation where we had no major storms for uh, since 2005, and suddenly all of this tree that in, in between the, the, uh, Wilma and Irma, in that case, were all chewed up by termite by the, the species, and we're losing trees to the point where we're jeopardizing the integrity of our urban tree canopy. We may reach a point where the trees are being chewed up faster than we're planting trees. And for South Florida, trees are fundamentally important. They provide shade. And shade is the most underrated resource that we have in Florida because otherwise we're cooking. Unfortunately, for most of them, Asian supreme termites, once they've been established, uh, the gin is out of the bottle, we can never put it back in. And now they're part of our lives and we're gonna have to deal with them forever. It's just part of the new norm. And that's something we need to accept because it's not gonna change. The thing that can be done is knowing what's going there and therefore knowing what to do to minimize potential for damage for structures and for the urban tree canopy. So here in yellow, you have a known case of infestation of Formosan supreme termites. In red is the Asian supreme termite. And you'll notice for the Asian supreme termites, here, this is Fort Lauderdale, it follows the south fork of a new river because they were brought by all of these half million boats that come in and out every year. And now I would claim that Fort Lauderdale, among other cities in Southeast Florida, are the prime exporters of termites for the rest of the world. So thanks for the boating industry, uh, which represent the 1% the top 1% of the population because they have disposable income to afford a very luxury boats are fully responsible for bringing them and shipping them. Thank you. That's job security for all of us, apparently. Let's zoom down to a bit south to the Miami area. You notice you have heavy infestation of Formosan in virus area in Miami Shore, in Hialeah, uh, in Adventura. But when you go to actual uh, the Biscayne Bay, uh, and around the airport in Miami, this is mostly a territory that is infested with Asian serpent termites. And the fact that it's so spread out and yet the city of Miami is, doesn't actually have a program to save their trees, to me is mind boggling that something got to be done. For Tardel in the same process, uh, I was able to work with the city for the past few years where we're trying to figure out a way to save the trees because they belong to the city and the tree actually care for the, for the, uh, the city actually care for this, this tree. So hopefully we can get somewhere. Now, as I told you, 
Asian serpent termites start colonies in trees. Therefore, as they chew up these trees and these trees fall under their own weight because their integrity is compromised, South Florida is in the process of irreversibly losing its urban tree canopy. What is missing here, the pest control industry is not necessarily looking at trees when they do termite treatment for structures. The tragic part of this is termites for that species starts in trees. And therefore you have a window of time where you can inspect the trees, detect the colony early, eliminate the colony, save a tree and prevent damage to structures because the colony will only infest structure if it's big enough, which means if it has spent enough time in a tree. So by establishing an inspection program, either that is could be a citizen-based science, it could be the pest control industry that get their things together and do the right thing, start inspecting the trees. And for all these trees that don't belong to private owners, but belong to the streets within the cities, the city has a responsibility, and to some extent the county, to make sure that we are not losing all these trees. My point is, we have to start checking of the trees, because trees are half of a problem. Once you find them, you can eliminate colonies, save a tree, prevent damage down the road to nearby structures. Now, how do we kill them? That's the easy part, I would say. The thing is, if you don't know you have termites, you don't have treatments, therefore you're missing the whole point. Let's go back. You gotta check the tree first. Inspection is half the job. Once you have it, then you can contact the pest control operator and can do something about it. Now, there's two classical approach on how to protect structures again, subterranean termites. The first one is the use of liquid termiticide. You trench around the house, any termites coming from outside, encounter the treatment and die in the process. The problem is with this, and we extensively prove it, it does not kill the colony. It's just make the colony stop going through that, that treatment. And the colony is fine, it's going somewhere else, still chewing on the next tree, still chewing on the next house. Therefore, this colony will completely life cycle, make more elates, make more colonies, and the potential for damage remains until the chemical barrier breaks down, which is designed over time within depending one to five years, depending on the environmental conditions. And then the colony that is literally five to 10 feet away from the treatment is gonna come back and do damage to structures. We are at a point here at the University of Florida to say that if you're dealing with Formosa or Asian spring termites, the use of liquid termiticide is basically a band-aid, which you're kicking the can down the road. The alternative would be the use of baits and you plant them around the structures as a colony, uh, expand its territory, encounter this bait, feed on it. And the idea of bait is they don't die immediately, they bring it back to the colony, share it with everyone. And within 60 to 90 days, the whole colony collapses and we reach colony elimination. That is true for native serpent termites. It is true for Formosan serpent termites. Infor unfortunately, in the past year, we recently published a paper about this with my colleague, Dr. Nanya Su. It doesn't quite work for Asian serpent termites because their foraging pattern is different. It's still good to have these in the ground because you have Formosan too, so may as well keep them, by the way. The thing is, currently on the market, there's, there's, there's three different products that are sold commercially. One is through BSF, one is through its extra, uh, which is uh, insistex, sorry, and the one is through the Cortiva Centricon. All of them work fine, technically. The only thing that separates all of these, and I believe, I hope this is temporary, that companies will pick up the reality of the problem and move on to what needs to be done. Is one of the company has access to what we call an above ground bait, which is the same thing, 
except the formulation is different where you don't have to plant it in the ground and wait for the termites to found it. You can literally put it on a silver platter and put it where exactly you find active termite infestation. Initially, uh, in the old days, we found a termite infestation, we drill a hole, we foam. This is not sustainable for the same reason of the fumigation I mentioned earlier. You just kill the termites that were in a tree, you temporarily protect the tree, but the colony away from that tree is fine and will continue to make damage somewhere else and make new colonies. So for me, the use of IPM is not quite the use of liquid termiticide because this is not sustainable. We're just literally putting a Band-Aid on the problem. Why did I mention these above ground baits? Kind of insisted earlier that you need to inspect the trees. And that's why it's so important. Because once you start looking for trees, you start seeing them everywhere where they have established. And it's so easy to detect once you know and cue your eyes to the signal that there's an infestation. These above ground bait station needs to be mixed with water because water is the magic ingredient. As I mentioned, these termites need water to thrive. And by mixing the bait with water, uh, you basically invite them for dinner. Uh, it's like you, if you go to a bar, you go for the drink and maybe you're gonna stay for the food. Termites behave exactly the same. Get into the bait station for the water and then stay because they realize this is actually good food to eat. And that is what I meant by serving it on a silver platter where you basically bring the bait directly where they are here on the case on the matube on an avocado tree. They come inside, they clear it completely within a week or so, and within 60 to 90 days, the colony collapses and dies. Uh, I have another version, which is about two and a half hour uh, session. Uh, if you're interested in actually understanding the biology behind all of this, we will have a termite course for professional in January, uh, uh, end of January here in Fort Lauderdale. And there's a website for this that you can register if you want to spend three days just learning about termite biology. The beauty of these baits is they're actually kind of foolproof at this point. They're easy to use and they're efficient to a point where once you have them inside, you know the colony is doomed. The key is inspection. Again, once you have active termites, you know where to put it. These bait stations are useless if you put it where there's no termites. It has to be a place where there's live activity. And what's happening, the bait is chewed up, is replaced with mud, which is their fecal material. And at this point, you know the colony is, is done for. Now, to, to finish this talk, I'm going to talk about what I did with the city of Fort Lauderdale and the, the, uh, uh, the Department of Agriculture can help financially to make this happen. The idea here is we have a bunch of parks that belong to the city and a lot of these trees are infested. And if we don't do anything, we're going to lose them. So all of the red dots that you see is Asian spring termite infested trees. And I also included a lot of trees on private properties of homeowners who asked to be part of this project. So I did a total of 113 trees in six city parks and 18 private properties. This is a case for Riverland Preserve, which is a small park in, actually not such a small park in uh, the city of Fort Lauderdale. The red dots were active infestation of Asian subs. We treated all the trees with a formulation of above ground baits in October, 2019. Uh, by May 2020, we cure all the trees. In July 2021, we came back. We have new infestation because it's a whack a mole game. We're killing one colony at a time. And we may have missed the ones that are so small that they could not be detected. All the ones that were active, we uh, treated again and we eliminated the colony back in 2021. I just started at park again. Five trees are infested. Uh, so about three years later, two years later. So when I say we play wakamo, it's okay. We eliminating the colony, we stop the damage, we're saving the urban tree canopy at this point. 
here's the beauty of it. And this is where the beautiful silver lining is. In that park, initially we traded 27 trees with a total of 3.1 gram of active ingredients. And we didn't have any activity after two years there, except now we do have activity because since that slide, I did the survey. This is the equivalent amount of chemicals needed to save 27 trees, which is insanely small. This is by far the most environmentally friendly and the most efficient way to cure the trees, to prevent the colony to spread, and to infest nearby trees and structures. Find a mud tube, put the baits, you eliminate the colony, you save a tree. This is an avocado tree on my neighbor's uh, property. Another case in Bill Keefe Preserve. Again, all of these trees are infested. We use an above ground formulation and we cure the park. We expanded this 114 trees. We use a total of 10.9 gram of active ingredients in that case, which is again, is absolutely nothing in a grand schemes. So in case you've missed the important part, tree inspection is everything. Because once you know, all you have to do is find a pest control that carries the above ground bait formulations and the solution is right there. So inspection and error detection ultimately needs to be implemented one way or another. With the city of Fort Lauderdale, the goal is to train all the folks that are working in park and recreation because they're the one looking at trees, which is part of their job already. So the goal is to train them to identify the problem, report it so that the city can use a third party to cure the trees. The use of other above ground bait here reduce the total use of pesticide. And when, what I mean is in that situation, when I use 10.9 gram of active ingredients, if you would have gone the route with liquid termiticide, uh, you would have used about 20,000 gallon of toxic stuff that is basically killing everything that has six legs. Because one thing I forgot to mention, these bait stations only subterranean termites are affected. It doesn't matter if you have an end colony getting into it, the end colony is not even going to be affected. This is how specific the formulation and the active ingredient is. So anybody that says we need a green solution, we have it already. So can we move on to the important part, which is the inspection part? If we do this, we save uh, a lot of infested trees, we reduce the uh, overall termite pressure, in the area and we prevent potential damage uh, to structures that are nearby by simply eliminating the colonies within surrounding environments. So this is the message I had for you today. This is a reality. I was in Miami uh, sometime in January, I think. No, it was December. And I went to the art district and I was walking around and I have a terrible habit, which uh, it's difficult when you have a family that want to go somewhere, is to look at trees. And virtually every one out of two trees that I looked at had mud tubes or heavy damage already obviously visible in trees along the different streets that we walk to. These trees are on the clock. And one thing that, that is very important is if nobody cares, if nobody look into it, let me um, share my screen. So if nobody cares, then we are losing the urban tree canopy. And there's one thing that I really hope somebody uh, will pay attention is, first, homeowners need to know, the pest control industry need to be updated. Landscapers are part of the solution because again, they're the one trimming the trees and they can detect these, tree, these infestations early on. Finally, local governments don't think the state will do anything. Don't think the county may do anything. It's gonna be localized. The reason for this is, uh, give me a second so I can bring this up. Uh, let me share that screen. Uh, where is it? This one. 
uh, you are seeing this, it's going to come up. This is directly available if you Google termite distribution in Florida. Boom. It's going to be one of the top thing after the, the sponsored one. And basically what you're going to see, uh, are you seeing the map right now? Yes? Okay. This is a map of Florida, and this is the current distribution of all, all the termite species that we know of as it was reported to us. And we update this map once a year, which I'm about to do at the end of the dry wood termite season, uh, where we're going to have a bunch of new data. We have 7,000 data points. We have a bunch of new sample come that came from Fort Myer. Uh, not Fort Myer, what I'm saying. Um, Tampa, here we go. In Tampa, we see red dots. We got about a dozen new samples of red dots there. That means that Asian southern termite is fully established in South Tampa. Congratulations, they have it too. So welcome to the club. It's not just us now. Uh, it's just a matter of time before it spread. But if you go to Miami here, you see exactly where all of these species are. So let me remove the drywood termites. Let me remove the Formosan termites. And here, just focus on the Asian spring termites. If you work in these areas as a pest control, as an arborist, as a landscaper, or as a city official, or a county one, to that respect, start looking at trees and you'll notice the scale of a problem. If you're outside of these areas that with red dots and you actually find it, I need that data point because I need to put that dot on the map. We provide a free termite ID services at the University of Florida here. You can go through the extension of this that will bring it to us or you can simply send it to us and I can email you right back. All we need is when it was found, where it was found, the address, who took it, and um, and get the sample to me because I need to confirm that it's the right species. Remember, we have 15 species in Southeast Florida, and and you'll found a lot of different species in trees that are not a problem. So identification is actually quite important. Unfortunately, there's literally five people in the state of Florida that can identify termites accurately. I'm one of them, lucky you, and I'm accessible to you. So this service is for free. Um, I will send the edits publication to Henry so he can forward it to you because it tells you everything you need to know to get started at least for the identification process and how to submit a sample. And at any point in time, please use that map. You can upload it in your phone as a Google map layer. And that Google map layer, can you can keep it permanently or temporarily uh, in the app. And anywhere you go, you bring the app and you see all these dots and you know you are in Formosan territory or Asian subs territory. Um, and that if you are somewhat involved within the business of termites or if you have a role within the solution, this is an information that is absolutely fundamental. Knowing where they are, knowing where to start, is halfway the job, basically. So to summarize, check the trees. Once it's done, find a way to get an above ground station on that tree. If you find active infestation in the house, above ground tree, uh, above ground station work as good as on a tree. All you need is to make sure that they feed on that station and the colony is doomed within 60 to 90 days. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, there are so many questions here in the chat, uh, Dr. Chovang. Uh, let's see here if I see it. Uh, one talk about the active ingredients of the of the bait. Mm -hmm. So the the active ingredients currently on the market, you have Novaluron in the Trelona uh, bait station, that is only an in-ground bait station. Uh, it works great, but they still do not have a knob of ground formulation, which they're working on it for the past 20 years. I'm still waiting for it. I want it out there. Don't get me wrong. I need the above ground station for Trelona. So any folks out there that are using it have this solution in hand. The second one is the Xterra, which used diflubenzoran, 
that has an in-ground and above-ground. Unfortunately, the active ingredient has limited activity on subterranean termites, paradoxically, ironically. Finally, the, the, the centricon system have a good on-ground bait station and a great above-ground formulation that use no valerum. All of these, um, so the last one, sorry, is only accessible to uh, companies that are licensed to the Centricon program, which is unfortunately very few companies in Florida, in South Florida. Not everybody has access to it yet, working on it. All of these ingredients are chitin synthesis inhibitors. Why? Why I emphasized early in my talk that termites are composed of juvenile individuals implies that these juvenile individuals need to molt for the rest of their lives until they die out of old age within three to four years of life. So these workers need to molt regularly throughout their life. The chitin synthesis inhibitor is basically a time bomb that once ingested by the foragers, does not affect at all their physiology or their biology or their behavior. They bring it back to the nest, share it with everybody, and within just a week or two, everybody has a lethal dose, except nobody dies. Yet, what's happening is, as a worker is getting ready to molt, shed its old skin to get to the next version of itself, as with a new cuticle, new skin, it shed its old skin, does not produce a good cuticle and bleeds to death in the process. So this is why this formulation, these formulations are so stupterian termite specific because most of the other insects out there, whatever you see is an adult and adults are not affected by the CSI, by the chitin synthesis inhibitors. And this is why not only it's the least toxic compound that you can think of because it's so exclusive to the pest we're looking for. The amount we use is so small that it makes it, uh, I would say the greenest technology on earth for a, any type of pest. And there's a big misconception, misconception that this is actually what's happening there. So the use of this above ground bait is unfortunately not universal for two reasons. The number of products in the market are not enough, their quality is variable, and the ones that are really good are not always accessible. The problem is deeply human, financial, and political. We understand the biology of a bug, the science is done, I did my part, now people, need, you need to get your shit together and make it work. That's my opinion there. <laughs> Sorry for my French, Barry. <laughs> AG stands for above ground bait which is the formulation that you make wet directly on the bait, while the IG, which is an in-ground station of the one that is solid, uh, that doesn't need to be wet, cannot be wet really, put in the ground for the serpent termite to find it as a forage. Works great on native subs, work fantastic on Formosans, has limited impact on Asian subs. So just to make our life a bit more complicated. <laughs> I believe that Asian subs, are gonna be the biggest problem if in South Florida within the next 20 years. For some neighborhoods with all of these red dots that I showed you, it already is the case. Uh, we have another one here. Uh, can we use uh, the above ground bait station in houses? Yes, absolutely. And it's what I've been recommending. If you have access to above ground, uh, anywhere you find active termites, there's a way to do it and actually, I brought my props. Uh, let me close that so you can see me bigger. There you go. This. Uh, basically, imagine it's a two by four. This is your house. It's full of termites. You have activity. What you do, you make this wet and uh, staples. It works fine. Uh, you can use it that way, or there's a plastic box to make it pretty, especially if it's visible by the consumer, the homeowners. It doesn't look to see it, to look at this. Um, so it's perfectly fine on. Uh, trees and it's perfectly fine on in structures wherever you have a matube that's the way to do it in my opinion spot treatments is again 
a band-aid using liquid chamelis sides of foams. I'm at a point where I have a hard time saying that we should continue using liquid chamelis side. Now, because I'm a state employee, I cannot tell you to not use it. It's still a solution, but in my opinion, baits have been uh, far more efficient once you have activity. Doing spot treatment drilling everywhere in, a, in the wall is basically chasing them away, around, I would say. Well, baits, all you have to do is one in, one in the bait station, and it does the job. Full disclaimer, I'm not paid by any of these companies. I'm a state employee, remember. <laughs> quick quick question. Uh, to use the bait, do you need, help, do, do you need to have the thermi um, thermite license? Yes, unfortunately, despite the fact that these are kind of foolproof and easy to use, if you want to apply it, you need to be certified not only by the state of Florida through the FDAX license or for WDO, you need to be licensed through the company who provides you the bait program, at least for this version of the, the, the Centricon version. For the Trelona and for the Xterra, you don't need to be licensed through the company because you can get it through your distributor. Uh, the problem is they don't have good above ground bait station yet, which feel free to call them and tell them I sent you. Okay. Do you have any name for the above ground baits? Um, so commercial the, name? The, the commercial name that is currently available is the Centricon station through the Cortiva Corporation. That is the one that uh, is it's the only one good above ground bait out there. The the one from Extra uh, is available, but is still using the flubenzaron, which uh, I have my issues with that. Although I'm recorded, so be careful, don't spread it out. The thing is, we know that diflubenzaron as is is doesn't have such a longevity to reach elimination for large colonies, which this is why I have my reserve. But they do have an above ground, so use it. Uh, you can feel free to play with it. If it works, let me know. Um, the, the one through Trelo, uh, the Trelona through BSF works great. It's a fantastic active ingredient, great formulation for in-ground bait station. They do not have an above ground on the market yet. And uh, if you are a user from the BSF Trelona, uh, make sure you talk to your representative to put pressure on them that it would be fantastic to have an above ground base station. So I'm not limited to say use this because that's by default the one we have, which is unfortunate, uh, which makes no sense to me because this has been on the market for 25 years. It's hmm. absurd that we're at this point where 1% of companies are using it. This is pure insanity because we have a solution. Nobody knows about it. Nobody knows it's there or very few people have access to either way. I'm at a point, as a scientist, I'm really frustrated because mm. we know what to do. It's just that this, everybody has a different agenda, apparently, which is good for them. I, ma I made sure that all the three companies I cited hate me for that good reason. It's okay. <laughs> I'm happy to upset people if we can change what to, to change the status quo. Status quo is complacency, and in that case, with a changing environment, status quo is no longer acceptable. Yeah, I feel your pain. All right, everybody, so 104, uh, let me uh, launch the post test here. Hopefully everybody know the, the question by now. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chavon. Some amazing information here. Um, I, I will share with you the edit publication that you can share with all the participants. Thank you. My pleasure. So you guys uh, can can do the post test. It will be great. So we can go to launch. Yay. And actually, if, if you guys are there, I'm putting the link to the publication in the chat that you can take directly. And Henry, you can forward it to everybody who is already gone. Right. Do you want to uh, uh, check the, the answers, Dr. Chavon, okay. here? 
Uh, we're still waiting. Well, we only have seven participants. Let's give them time. All right, let's wait. Ten more seconds. Mm -hmm. Right. We only have half the participants here doing it. I guess people are want to go to lunch. Yeah. Well, get it done so we can move on. <laughs> okay, almost there. Okay, so um, let's start with question one. Let's do this. Yep. So 1980 was the year for most serpent termites we detected. 1996 is for Asian serpent termites. In that case, it was 1986 because the question was about Asian sub. So it's a bit better than earlier, but still, I had mentioned 1980 for two today. I, I, it was a trick one. Um, the new colonies established through uh, swarming, most of you got it. Asian uh, colony starts in trees, You most of you got it. And the colony must have access to water source. Finally, once detected, most cost-effective remedial, keyword is remedial treatment for elimination of the station is above ground bait station. So it wasn't too bad. Great. All right, everybody, it's uh, 106. I don't want to be between uh, you guys and, and lunch. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm going to send the, the recording for this session. It was uh, amazing information. And if you can share this uh, with, uh, I know the city of Miami is here. If you can share with the uh, decision maker people. I know that many trees in the in parks are, are affected. So uh, let's do something, guys. Thank you very much. Uh, happy weekend. Bye-bye. Happy weekend. Thank you. Bye -bye.